so I'll make uh, today a, uh, an overview of the fury as well. You can see there the familiar, maybe to you, Dunkin diagrams, A, D, and E in the upper left corner. And I would like to mention that uh, a former student uh, at Penn State, uh, Chuck Doran, who is now here, because former assistant professor at Penn State, yes, we just happened to meet in the elevator and it turned out that just before uh, he left to become a professor at Brown University, uh, I gave him a copy of this uh, poster and uh, he has worked on uh, Calabi Yao manifolds and has uh, managed to already uh, identify the graph the higher graph of type AN and was working hard to find the exceptional so one can uh, work with these things further on and, uh, and you can uh, contact uh, Chuck, maybe he'll be in, the, in our discussion to ask him questions about it. Very good, so um, this is uh, what I would like to talk about, namely uh, about the the way uh, the uh, the general outline of the course will be. You see, it's a. Uh, um, it turns out that the best behaved um, Lie groups, uh, which we shall construct actually in uh, from scratch in this course, so this is, uh, we want to do maybe a classification, although we, we shall do several classifications, but, uh, but we shall definitely construct them directly. So these best behaved uh, Lie groups are called the simple Lie groups, and the way you can see that the best behaved is that they, they have, uh, when they act upon themselves, uh, the, that representation is well behaved. And somehow that extends to all the way in which they act. So they have go a good representation theory. And these are built out of, the, uh, out of a structure which is very familiar to physicists, the group uh, SU2, the, uh, the spinners group, uh, by putting things together in a crystallographic way. And uh, very surprisingly, and this is a uh, starting uh, a starting uh, point for the course, it will be, is that um, this group SU2 has finite subgroups. It's almost the same as the rotation group SO3, and uh, it has finite subgroups, and uh, one of the most interesting one is the symmetries of a dodecahedron. Yes? And... Uh, and amazingly, uh, if you look very carefully at the symmetries of the dodecahedron, they give you precisely the information on how to glue together copies of SU2 to build the most uh, complicated and interesting uh, exceptional structure, the Lie group of type E8. So that's one thing that we'll do. Uh, today, uh, Hopefully, we'll reach, uh, we'll make some computations with a Dunkin diagram D4. This Dunkin diagram D4 looks like this. And, uh, and, uh, um, what this Dunkin diagram tells you is how to assembly, assemble copies of SU2 to get a big orthogonal group. Now, you, you should be very familiar with this from elementary mathematics, where you have the rotations in 3D assembled out of copies of two-dimensional rotations, right? And uh, this uh, sculpture, well, this is a model of the sculpture, really. Uh, this model of the sculpture uh, is uh, is precisely can be read as a recipe on how to put a copy of SU2 at every uh, 
at every corner and glue it according to the edges. So this is what's called a root system of type uh, D4. And uh, I couldn't bring the whole sculpture, so I brought the model, but I also brought just for uh, figuring out the scale of the thing and the way it's built. I also built, brought one triangle of it. Yes, it's one of these triangles that you see here. Yes. And this is a shadow in uh, three dimensions of an equilateral triangle in uh, 4D. Yes, it's projected on uh, first on the sphere S3, so on the quaternions themselves, on the group SU2. And then from there it's projected stereographically. Then it's uh, cut by a machine uh, as an open letter U, and then it's brought together and hammered on a sphere and finally welded by one of the best welders in the world under inert gas. Now, uh, so what we'll do is uh, the following look. You see, what you, what you seem to see there are the Duncan diagrams. Yes, uh, I actually, I heard the story from Duncan himself. Uh, he was in the seminar of uh, Israel Moisevich Gelfand, who was frightening everyone because he was always uh, uh, hammering down any colleague or student or anyone around if he found the slightest fault in their thinking. And there were crystallographic uh, structures which had been found by the French Carton and, uh, and uh, um, Duncan was asked to make a presentation in Moscow on that subject. And so he worked three weeks on the presentation. And he found that the, the whole st crystallographic structure could be encoded in a special basis. And this basis is what you see there as a diagram. Namely, you have some vectors, and if the angle is 120 degrees, a third of a circle, there is a line between the vectors, and if it's 90 degrees, there's no line. And uh, so that's what you seem to see. On the other hand, what you really see there are, the, the, are some uh, representations, and again, we'll, we'll study those, and we'll define them, some representations of a quantum subgroup, uh, of some quantum subgroups of SU2. So exactly the, the way in which you can take these rotations and put them into different, map them into different vector spaces, which I have defined, these quantum subgroups. So those uh, things have a much, uh, much bigger structure, the vertices can be multiplied, uh, expanded, and you can make a whole topological quantum field theory out of them. So that's the idea. You start from some uh, symmetry of uh, some subgroup, and, uh, and then you represent that, and that gives you recipes on how to put together copies of this to get uh, to get the higher symmetry. That's what we're going to build. And we're going to show that, uh, for instance, the AN, uh, do you notice there the AN graphs? Yes, for SU3. Uh, the usual AN graph, if you use to uh, do the representations of SU2, as physicists are, uh, consists of uh, spins, 0, 1 half, 1, and so on. This is cut off, what you see there, and, uh, and uh, you can recognize that the diagrams AN for SU3 are, uh, are uh, cut offs of the representations of SU3. And uh, they can be, and uh, further down SU4, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, there are these exceptionals. The exceptionals uh, with, uh, with some mistakes were found by, were guessed actually, by physicists from the Centre de uh, Recherche Nucléaire, uh, uh, Centre d'Energie Atomique Saclay, 
in France, the Francesco and Giver, and uh, they uh, gave a, a bottle of champagne for the classification, so I convinced them to accept that, that the criteria were, uh, were a bit off, and uh, I got this bottle in the southern, in Patagonia, actually, of all things. We flew on a small airplane, and uh, I noticed that the bottle was in the backpack of Zibert. And my students made sure that the bottle would not get broken. And we drank it all uh, right there. Uh, so this is this classification. So we'll go through this. Uh, one of the goals of this course is to classify the objects that you see here. At least the SU3 part, just the new objects. And then to build this higher math. And in the higher math, you have surfaces, combinatorial surfaces, which are bent by operators with all kinds of tunnels and, uh, and things like this. And that should be a kind of internal way in which uh, four-dimensional matter works. Now what about... Hmm? Well, the higher math is, uh, is uh, starting from the fact that uh, underlying the whole usual math Everything that you uh, learned uh, in, uh, in Linear Algebra 101, underlying that is a group SU2. In all ways, its representations, its weights, everything. And in the higher math, you build the same, but out of SU3, SU4, and so on. So you find some uh, higher uh, roots, higher weights, uh, higher representations and higher matrices acting on those representations. And um, the, the hope, uh, I, I have not uh, filled all the details, but I'll be here for one year and this will continue as uh, research seminars in the spring. So the hope is that that would, will fill exactly uh, the that would give the mathematics for a QFT in uh, uh, non-perturbative in, in uh, 3 plus 1 dimensions. So it's a very tall goal, but you should really aim at, uh, at something, uh, something like that. So, uh, and uh, as a test, which I, uh, so, uh, I was uh, suggested by my host, uh, Professor Jaffe, that uh, my host and friend, that uh, I should uh, do a bit less uh, uh, details, uh, not only in the first two lessons, but uh, tell, speak a bit more about what we're going to do. So here's one concrete thing that we're going to do. You see, uh, first of all, on a more computational level, and this is uh, this is a uh, uh, you see on a computational level, this is this is a computational thing. Yes, we need a machine in, in which we put data and uh, and it works. And I have this as programs, which will be distributed to you. And what we shall achieve with that is the representation theory machine, which you can see here, as a first and, and unexpected result. This is a dream of every student who first takes representation theory, and I must say that it was also mine, is that you have some kind of machine into which you put the group, a finite group, just given by its generators acting as permutations. And the machine just, uh, you can crank the machine and it gives you the irreducible representations explicitly so that if you don't know anything about it, uh, about representation theory, you can still guess what's going on and all the coefficients and all that. Yes, so we'll have exactly such a machine. This will be done in one of the later lessons. And uh, notice this is a Swedish, this is borrowed from a Swedish uh, website which is very appropriately called uh, dreamtime.com. You see. So um, another thing very concrete, which actually just happened uh, 
in the last few days was uh, something that uh, physicists use. This is the uh, this is uh, the the Wigner uh, 3J symbol, which describes which describes uh, uh, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients in es in essence. The way in which when you tensor to represent to spin representations of SU2, so if you take if you add, for instance, two spins, you measure the sum. You want to know what information it gives you on the on the spins which you cannot measure anymore due to the restraints in quantum mechanics. So what you need is exactly the way in which a tensor product of two representations breaks into pieces. This was computed a brilliant formula, but obtained in a very hard way by uh, by Wigner, as you can see here from uh, spherical integrals. That's due to the fact that if you want something to be invariant and you have a, a compact group, you can simply average over it. That's what he did there. And he found some very strange factorials. Now, the opinion on this uh, on these uh, Factorials is, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, from a current book. There exists a general formula of a cumbersome for human by straightforward for a machine. Yes, and uh, you see I have ordered uh, a machine to pop up just at the right moment. Um, and uh, this, uh, since it's so useful, was put up by uh, the National Institute of Standards into a table. Yes, aimed probably at graduate students who get locked into the basement while they're doing an experiment without communication with the outside. So, uh, so here, just for that, you see the, the table is sold uh, Yes, which uh, obviously makes physicists very happy. So, uh, so now uh, what we shall show is that the uh, the uh, formula of uh, the formula of Wigner describes simply some uh, triangles and squares in that. Yes, it describes uh, it describes some triangles and squares in that. You see, uh, uh, I am uh, I am also an opera singer, and uh, what you learn there is that uh, if the orchestra is too loud, you can always sing even louder. Now, so what uh, what the uh, what the formula of Wigner describes is some squares. Do you see? Wow. So it describes these squares and triangles. Yes. So on the three, on the bottom you have uh, the three on the three edges of the bottom you have the three J symbols. So they measure some. Uh, multiplicities at this point, for instance, three, four, and five, yes? Then you have here some lines which describe what happens to tensors, the way they pair. So you have here one, two, and three lines. Then you have here some lines which, as we'll show, encode exactly the powers E1 to the power K2 to the power L of SU2, and finally, they're connected by some surfaces inside, squares and triangles. And in our higher mathematics, we shall look exactly at these higher dimensional pictures. So the formula of, uh, of Wigner is describing exactly what happens in a, a very simple way, actually, in one of these pyramids. So that's, uh, that's uh, one of the goals of this course. And... Uh, I have also uh, 
brought you, and this is the last part, yes. Right. Right. I have no idea. I mean, I looked at this literally about uh, uh, less than one week ago at the Wigner formula, and I just noticed once again that if you, uh, do you see here at the bottom of the last row, six factorials, yes, a product of six factorials with one parameter R, right? These are exactly in this pyramid. I, if you don't take the horizontal, they are exactly six. There are three triangles. Can you see here a triangle at every edge, near every vertex? Yes. The triangle, I, this, it moves in this one. Yes, it's a triangle like this. Yes. And uh, there are, so three triangles, and there are three squares. Yes. And the freedom that you have, if you look only on the outside, is exactly to, to replace the sum of the three squares with the sum of the three triangles. And that is exactly the parameter R that you see in the, in Wigner, the summation parameter. So summation parameter R is just measuring this. So you can see here, I'm trying to answer Arthur's question, about the way in which uh, higher mathematics would work. Namely, it would not, uh, it what it would uh, describe is a relation between several representations, the interaction between representations, which has been uh, seriously understudied. And uh, interactions and interactions between interactions, for instance, a higher manifold, in my view, um, when when uh, we're going to build them is going to to be of the type of a uh, um, of a manifold connected connecting three things yes so it's uh, cobordism but a much more detailed version of cobordism yes so uh this much about the uh the introduction and uh, let me uh, put here, so I have, uh, I have put here some notes on the one-dimensional uh, quantum field theory, some fairly detailed notes on the, on the syllabus. Yes. Um, this is a bit what we did last time, and there was a very good question on that. Now I'm going to uh, take that away. and uh, mute the uh, mute the projector it's on the canvas website and this file is attached in the syllabus yes and uh, let me see here if I have the uh, I seem to have a uh, I seem to have a uh, uh, image mute let's see yes Yeah, we have also printed copies of the syllabus. Yes, and you can uh, you can find them. Look, they're here. There's a whole heap of them. So, uh, but uh, as I said, the actual uh, syllabus has attached has attached uh, to it the files like this one. Now, Let me remind you fast what uh, we did in the one-dimensional theory. We'll have the precise definitions just a tad later because uh, they are very uh, hard to give without a motivation. The, uh, and we'll do that right after, right after this one-dimensional theory, maybe the two-dimensional theory. So here what we said was that we have here a, a manifold one-dimensional manifold 
it has some, it's oriented, it has some uh, orientation for the boundary. And, uh, and then basically the manifold produces a vector in the boundary. And actually, we can, we can use it in very different ways. And you should be careful here because you should be able to recognize what this is in the next five minutes. So uh, one thing is that you can take a, uh, so this one, because it's representing empty space, it has a property that if you put two of these together, it gives you the same. And that if you flip it, you also get the same. So we decided that this was a projection. And, uh, and we can use this in various ways. For instance, we can, we can uh, put here a vector v. So there's here a vector v. Let's put just a vector v for the dot. Yes. So we take here v in v. Uh, we put it on one entrance. We use this as an entrance. And this is the exit. Yes. What would come out? Can you see? Yes. PV, obviously. So what comes out here is PV. Now, uh, another way to use the same is to use two entrances, V. And W. Yes. Now there's uh, nothing that comes out. Nothing in tensorial QFT means uh, the scalars. Yes, so this should be a number. And the number, can you guess it? Can somebody figure it out immediately? That's? Yes? It's in a product, of course. So this is PV in a product with W. Yes? Uh, what about using the same? So this is just, uh, it shows you how the dictionary works, but as you'll see, it shows you much more. What about uh, if we use both as exits? This is a little bit uh, trickier question. Can you figure out? So now you get uh, the exit is in, uh, this thing will be in V tensor V bar. So this is V of the boundary. Yes. How can you get? Yes. You have no vector at all, but you should get vectors. Yes. So what would be the formula? Right, right. So you sum over. Well. You should get a sum, yes. That, that's that's a general idea, yes. That's absolutely it. It's exactly. So so uh, uh, yes. So what you get here is exactly the sum over v in v. By this is an abuse of notation. This means in an orthonormal basis of v independent independent on the choice of basis this is implicit in this notation for us 
the sum over V in V of, uh, and this is P V tensor V bar. Yes. And as you can see, this is exactly, uh, this is independent of the basis, right? And this in V tends to V bar. So if you change the basis by unitary, then the unitary gets out at the other end. And now my challenge to you is that you have seen this thing from the first day when you set foot in, uh, in a physics building. What is it? No, Arthur, no, no, I, I ask this. this is <laughs> <laughs> what extremely familiar, most familiar thing that you see every day, that you use every day about 10 times or so, at least if you're a physics student. What is that? You put things on one side, you can put things on both sides. You, what is it? It was invented 80 years ago. It's exactly the Dirac bracket notation, yes? So this is a Dirac bracket notation. So uh, you see, and it's the most successful notation in, uh, in uh, physics. Namely, what you have is an operator P, for instance, let's translate the last one. Do you see this one, yes? The operator P, and these are the bra and the cats. Yes, this is a sum of uh, over V in V of P V, yes? Tens uh, V, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, of course, P followed by P is P, yes. And uh, even as we did last time, you can have different kinds of vacua this pushes it a little bit, the notation, so you can have what we denoted by Pij, which would be simply P from the I to, from the J to the I, something like this. I don't even know whether it was, whether it is used at all in physics, but then the notation of this would suggest that Pij times Pjk is equal to P I K. Yes? So this just takes you this these things just take you from one space from one kind of vacuum to another. And uh, moreover remember that uh, at the suggestion of somebody who was uh, who is in the audience uh, we solved the one dimensional uh, TQFT by finding a basis, an orthonormal basis, in P of V in the image. Uh, let's call this basis So this was our uh, machine. Our machine was the algorithm, the Gram-Schmidt algorithm, right? It was taking the vectors in the image and finding an orthonormal basis. And uh, can you can somebody see already how that solve your projections? So if you have a basis in the image, what's the formula? So you have a basis, an orthonormal basis in the in the image of a projection. How do you write the projection? Exactly. 
Wonderful, thank you. So this is exactly in that case, P is a sum of a W in P of V, yes, of P of uh, W tensor, the tensor is not written usually in physics times W, yes? And now it gives you, uh, it gives you everything, uh, it gives you every computation. And I think you had a very good question uh, last time about what's the interpretation of the identity in this, because the point was that if you sum them the other, I mean, that this is, this, this thing here is the identity on P of V, yes? What should be uh, the bracket formulation of the identity? What does the, the identity do? Can you see that? So if you, if you have V times the identity and then v W, yes? What is this? should be a bit bold in this. It's V, W, of course, yes? So what happened to the identity? Just extract it from there. It contracts exactly. The identity contracts to a line, yes? So one manifold, which is the identity, will contract, which is what we work with all the time, yes? And of course, in the time of, uh, of uh, yes, in the time of uh, Dirac, they couldn't uh, do typographically uh, bringing uh, a segment together head to tail, yes, which would be something like uh, P. Yes, bring it head to tail. So what should this correspond to? How can we glue things? Now remember how we glue things. You see, if you want to glue an operator A with an operator B, this is a sum of all V and V. This is a very important formula of A V times V B, yes? And this is this here is exactly the gluing procedure that I mentioned. That's why we have to have vector spaces on the boundary so that we glue them exactly with this formula. Yes? And now uh, what would this be? How can you glue the two ends of P together? Take the case, yes. So the two ends of V, you glue them together. This should be here exactly P the sum of all V's of P, V, V. You see, this is a gluing. And this is a trace of P. Yes? And now, what kind of uh, material is this? So again, this is very simple, but we'll reach exactly in higher dimensions at the kind of things you see there. So this is just a dictionary. So uh, now, uh, what this is, this is a question for the physicist. What, so, so uh, what kind of matter Does this P describe? In a few words. It's not a precise. We should be able to describe it physically, yes. Well, it's certainly, what are the proper, the local properties? It's, you can flip it, yes. 
you can subdivide it so it's uh, it's uh, right so it's infinitely so it's matter 1d matter which is um, isotropic the same in both directions that's p is equal to p star then because it's kind of empty it's what you can cut it in two right so how should we call it infinitely that's what the ancient Greeks were arguing about infinitely divisible wonderful so it's infinitely divisible Yes, and uh, it does something. Who goes through? Who goes through it? It's just empty space. But it obviously does something. You put a vector v at one end, and it comes out as the projection p of v at the other end. So it means that who passes only part of it yes so it's a kind of uh, let's say permeable wall yes only some and some means here linear subspace vectors v pass through yes another name for the, this kind of permeable wall in physics maybe we should call it a filter yes so it's a filter which lives which which lets only the vectors in p of v in the image pass through and the other ones are stopped yes so this is the uh, this is a kind of matter that we have described with this yes of course in the dirac bracket notation you can put all kinds of other operators yes which do much more complicated things and uh, you can even reformulate, for instance, a theorem in linear algebra, which would tell you that if you put uh, an operator, and here it's in more topological notation, if you have an operator A, and if uh, A commutes with It's adjoint, then A can be recovered from what? What is a complete ses set of invariants for A? This elementary linear algebra here. Hmm? Yes, so how are those encoded with our system, which, which uses traces? All kinds of numbers. Yes, what are those numbers? Hmm? Actually, a bit, a bit more explicit than that in pictorially. We'll wait a, a few more seconds. So you, you can take A, you can daisy chain them, yes, make nice beads. If I had 
there. You see, I had, if I had remembered uh, it, I should have brought a, a nice set of beads. Yes, so what you can do is, uh, is just daisy chain A's. Yes. Which is a characteristic polynomial. These are the, this gives you the coefficients. Here's a kind of exercise that I proposed to you. I didn't manage to do it. Maybe I didn't insist enough, but uh, I think that you're catching, uh, you're starting to catch the dictionary very well. Uh, make a fully pictorial proof, make a fully pictorial proof of the model for the matrix out of these daisy chain beads, yes? So you should use, these are a number, yes, such a, such a daisy chain bead is, you see it has no exit, so it is a trace of a to the power n. Yes, and if you have a trace to the power n, so implement everything you want. Imagine you, you, you have a free shot at uh, Lego supplies for life. Yes, and, uh, and you are to build uh, linear algebra, the usual linear algebra this way, yes? So you can see now that what we're aiming at is to do this, but in higher dimensions. One will be a bracket, uh, a kind of bracket notation in one dimension higher. How would it look like? What would you have in the middle? Exits and entries. Hmm? Yes, so one dimension higher, let's not think abstractly. Yes, how would it look like? Polygon, yes. So the higher dimensional notation the higher dimension, one dimension higher would be something like this, you see. This would be a higher dimensional Dirac bracket, yes? And you could assemble these in all kinds of ways. You see, you have much more freedom. So I remember that, uh, that, uh, acquaintance and friend, he was at Penn State, Roger Penrose was saying that if you, if you make the universe 10 times bigger, it gets quite a lot bigger, but if you add an extra dimension, then wow. You know, so, uh, so this will be the same here, yes? So we'll add the extra dimensions, yes? And that's what, uh, that's what we'll start to do next time in a very simple and humble way. I, I, we still have two minutes. Namely, we'll take a very simple graph like this. So first of all, we'll show that the graphs on that list, ADE, are the only small graphs. That's why they appear in a lot of branches of math. Then we'll take a, a graph like this. This is a graph D4, yes? And you can actually read it. I'll show you an image. You can read it on this sculpture. You can find here a ribbon, do you see here one edge, two edges, three edges from here, yes? So you can read on this the, uh, everything that we're going to do about the graph, a certain ribbon which will encode all, the, all these roots. And what we look at is the symmetry of this. Now what is the usual symmetry? It's a symmetric group S sim 3 right? the permutations of the three arms. But we'll show that besides that, it has some quantum symmetries, and altogether there are also only a finite number of them. And uh, 
We will show that this gives a completely new view to something that has been the tool of algebraics for a long time now, the quiver theory. We'll view the old quiver theory as additive. This new quantum symmetries will be a multiplicative version of that. And this thing has exactly uh, six quantum uh, symmetries, which are exactly uh, these. And I just want to put uh, to put this uh, as you, which one? Next time, next, uh, here, here. So these, uh, just a bit, um, the imi no image mute. And uh, so this would be exactly Oh, this is slow. So this would be exactly these uh, you see on this list, the maps from D4 to D4. You can see them ju now just appearing. Do you see here these maps from D4 to D4? The six ones are the classical ones, the six permutations. Yes, and the two things here are the new ones. And we'll show that they're related to a matrix of modular invariance in number theory. Uh, modular invariance to some representation of Hurwitz in number theory. So people who are here from the number theory side uh, will, will find the connection with that, all with topological quantum field theory. So that's a little outline of, uh, of the kinds of things that we'll do in this course. Thank you.